Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hey everyone, Craig Baird here. Before I begin today's story, I want to take a moment and ask that you check me out on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Canada EHX. There are several tiers with great benefits, from ad-free content to t-shirts and other cool stuff. And if you're a fan of Canadian History X, make sure you check out my other shows, From John to Justin and Canada, A Yearly Journey. And don't forget, you can also donate directly to the show at www.canadaehx.com. It helps keep this show going. All right, on with the show. A quick note, this episode includes the heroic death of a trusty and loyal companion. And it can be a little sad to hear. Please take care. Listener discretion is advised. In July of this year, I noticed my dog, an Irish setter Newfoundland cross named Boris, had a bit of a cough. I took him to the vet and was told he likely had laryngeal paralysis, a condition that could be life-threatening, but surgery could give him several more years of life. An appointment for Boris was made to visit a veterinary surgeon, and it was at that point a CT scan was scheduled. The CT scan discovered There was no laryngeal paralysis, but a long tumor that ran the length of his throat. At this point, Boris was given two weeks to live. I began to create a bucket list of items for him so he could enjoy the last two weeks to their full potential. I never got the chance to cross an item off on that list. On September 6th at 5 a.m., five days after the CT scan, Boris died in my arms. Boris was born on December 31st, 2011, and this New Year's Eve would have been his 11th birthday. As this episode comes out around his birthday, I wanted to honor Boris, my best friend, by sharing a tale of another Newfoundland dog, one who became a war hero and whose name lives on to this day. Please join me in my tribute to Boris as I bring you the life and legacy of Sergeant Gander the hero dog of the Battle of Hong Kong. I'm Craig Baird, and this is Canadian History X. Our story today does not begin at an army base, or even in Canada for that matter. It starts on a small farm in Newfoundland in the 1930s with the Hayden family and their dog Pal. The name Gander came later, but I'll refer to him as Gander from here on out. You may be saying to yourself, wait a minute, Newfoundland is in Canada. Well, at the time, despite its proximities and ties to Canada, Newfoundland was still its own dominion in the British Empire. In fact, it would not officially join Canada as the 10th province until 1949, well after our story ends. For the Hayden family, Gander was their children's favorite playmate, One of the earliest pictures of the beloved pet depicts him pulling the three children on a small toboggan attached to his large frame as they smile at the camera. Gander was no small dog, so pulling a sled with three children in it would have been an easy feat. The Newfoundland breed is known for being large, hairy, and having the personality of teddy bears with their people. Classified as a large working dog, known for their intelligence, strength, calm disposition, love of children, and deep loyalty. Gander fit this description well, as he was pushing 130 pounds and clearly great with children. The breed also excels at water rescue thanks to their thick double coat and webbed paws. Now, the irony of this description is never lost on me, because as a quick aside, Boris always hated the water. The heroic nature of this breed is well documented and a thing of legend. One unnamed Newfoundland dog is credited with saving Napoleon Bonaparte in 1815. During his escape from the island of Elba, he fell overboard. The dog jumped into the water and kept Napoleon afloat until he reached safety. Another Newfoundland dog in the early 20th century saved 92 people on the SS Ethi that wrecked off the coast of Newfoundland. The dog took a rope that was thrown into the water from the boat and brought the rope to shore to people waiting on the beach, allowing the passengers to use the rope to escape the ship. 
More recently, a 10-month-old Newfoundland named Boo saw a man drowning in a river in California. Boo immediately dove into the water and rescued the man. According to Janice Anderson, Boo's person, he had received no formal training in water rescue. Needless to say, the breed is known for its heroics. So, with that in mind, let's get back to Gander. There are conflicting stories about Gander's adoption, so we don't know for sure how he entered the military, but it could have gone one of two ways. Some sources state that Gander accidentally scratched the youngest Hayden son's face with his paw while playing. The other states that he grew too large for the family and was put up for adoption. Either way, the Royal Rifles of Canada, a regiment of the Canadian Army stationed at the Gander Airport, gladly adopted the large, beautiful dog. This is when he became Gander, because as soon as he was adopted, his name was changed and he was given the honorary rank of sergeant for his duties as the regiment's mascot. And by all accounts, Sergeant Gander loved his time with the regiment. He took part in parades and was photographed with his comrades several times during their time at the base. Andrew Flanagan was one of the Royal Rifles in 1940, and he said that, Gander quickly adopted to military life. He was elevated to sergeant faster than any enlisted man. One parade, he proudly marched up front, wearing his sergeant's stripes next to the regimental badge attached to his harness. Sergeant Gander took particular delight in sleeping on the runway of the Gander airport. There are reports of pilots radioing in that they couldn't land because Gander was enjoying a nap. For those pilots who didn't know Sergeant Gander, they often mistook him for a large black bear. But that idyllic life on the base was short-lived. In the summer of 1941, the Royal Rifles of Canada Regiment were sent to Hong Kong to defend the island colony in case of a Japanese attack. Now, the regiment could have left Sergeant Gander behind, but he was part of the regimental family at that point, and the soldiers wanted him in Hong Kong with them. Like most dogs, Sergeant Gander was not well-traveled, but now the Newfoundland who had never left the island was on his way to a new island, halfway around the world. And for the first few weeks, the soldiers lived well in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong dollar was worth 18 cents Canadian, so the soldiers hit the nightclub scene of the island with gusto. Some even hired locals to keep their gear and boots shining and their faces shaved. For Gander, Hong Kong was a big change from Newfoundland. Despite it being autumn there, the heat was intense, and Gander was meant for cold weather. Rifleman Fred Kelly was put in charge of taking care of Gander, and gave Gander long cold showers to help him deal with the Hong Kong heat. Gander loved sleeping in the shade of the veranda, and overall seemed to enjoy his first few weeks in the tropics. Sadly, this is a story of war and sacrifice, and those good times were about to come to an abrupt end. Now, although the Second World War began in 1939, war in Asia had been going on for a decade. The Empire of Japan was growing in strength, and in 1931, it invaded and conquered northeast China, known as Manchuria, followed by Inner Mongolia. In 1937, Japan invaded China proper, beginning a war that would leave 20 million Chinese, mostly civilians, dead by 1945. On September 27, 1940, Japan officially signed a pact with Germany and Italy, officially becoming an Axis power. And as England fended off a Nazi invasion over the English Channel, few troops were spared to deal with possible invasions of British territories in Southeast Asia. This is where Sergeant Gander and the Royal Rifle Regiment landed in Hong Kong. A few months later, fearing an oil embargo by the United States and with their own domestic reserves shrinking, Japan attacked the United States Pacific Fleet in Hawaii at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, which left 2,500 dead. Just one day later, Japan launched simultaneous attacks on British Hong Kong, British Malaya, and the Philippines. The Battle of Hong Kong had begun, and with the attack on December 8, 1941, the Royal Rifles along with the Winnipeg Grenaders became the first Canadian soldiers to see combat in the Second World War. They were joined by troops from the United Kingdom and India and the Hong Kong Volunteer Defence Corps. In all, there were over 14,000 troops defending the island and part of the mainland including 1,982 Canadians. But those numbers 
would not be high enough, as the troops were outnumbered 3-1. to one. As well, few members of the Royal Rifles had any field experience, and they were not fully equipped. They were supposed to be equipped with everything they needed when they reached Hong Kong, but this never happened. For the next week and a half, the Japanese army attacked various targets on the mainland to the north of the island, slowly moving to the south across Kowloon Bay to the island of Hong Kong. As night fell, on the evening of December 18th, Japanese troops launched four separate amphibious assaults across a three-kilometer front on the northern beaches of the island. Amid the battle, a portion of the Canadian forces retreated down an overgrown road as the Japanese pursued them. As they attacked the regiment's position, Sergeant Gander began to rush at them, barking and biting at the invader's legs. Royal Rifleman Andrew Flanagan described Sergeant Gander's demeanor during the battle as, Gander showed no fear of guns or bombs. At the Battle of Li Meng Gap, he attacked Japanese troops as they landed near the Canadian section. A second attack began as a group of Japanese soldiers advanced towards Canadian troops. Sergeant Gander once again charged out of the bush, once again forcing a retreat. The fact that it was night made it hard for the Japanese troops to see Gander as he came charging at them. Rifleman Reginald Law said, He growled and ran at the enemy soldiers, biting their heels. Japanese soldiers could be heard yelling, Black Devil, as they once again retreated. But they didn't relent. In order to protect the beloved dog, Sergeant Gander was placed near wounded troops where the hope was that he would be away from the intense fighting. Early in the morning on December 19th, Japanese troops began to approach wounded Canadians. Suddenly, a grenade was thrown and landed near the soldiers. With no one physically able to deal with it, death looked certain. At that moment, Sergeant Gander took the grenade in his mouth and ran back towards the Japanese forces. Gander, the dog that had pulled children on sleds, walked proudly in parades, and napped on runways, was killed in action, but saved wounded Canadian lives. Some say that Sergeant Gander was simply playing pitch and catch, believing it was a toy that he was returning. However, if you ask any of the veterans who were there that day, there was only one thing that Gander was doing. He sacrificed himself to save his comrades. I spent 11 years with a Newfoundland dog. I don't doubt that Sergeant Gander knew exactly what he was doing. He was saving lives. The Battle of Hong Kong lasted a few more days until Christmas Day 1941 and was thought of as an overwhelming defeat for Canadians and British troops and it seemed like Allied forces were doomed from the start in their defense of the island. After the battle, as the Japanese forces interrogated Canadian prisoners of war, they demanded to know about the Black Beast. They feared the Allies were training ferocious animals for warfare. The Canadian troops said nothing about Sergeant Gander. By the end of the Battle of Hong Kong, 290 Canadian troops were killed and 493 were wounded. For those who survived, the suffering had just begun. For the next three and a half years, they were prisoners of war and worked 12 hours a day in mines or on the docks in the cold. They were only given 800 calories a day to survive on, and a total of 267 Canadians died in the prisoner of war camps. Rifleman Andrew Flanagan said that Sergeant Gander proved to be a beacon of hope to those men who spent those hellish years as prisoners of war. He would say, Gander became a source of pride and encouragement for the Canadians who were captured and spent almost four years in the notoriously cruel Japanese POW system. Gander was their inspiration. By the end of the war in 1945, of the 1,975 Canadians who sailed from Vancouver for Hong Kong four years earlier, nearly 600 never returned home. As for Rifleman Andrew Flanagan, he weighed 68 pounds when he returned to Canada in the fall of 1945, and he passed away on February 28, 1993. His son Andy wrote, The scars of battle and torture remain until his dying days. He never complained and he never missed an opportunity to tell Sergeant Gander's story. While Sergeant Gander did not survive the Battle of Hong Kong, his name lives on. When the Hong Kong Veterans Memorial Wall was first proposed in Ottawa, 
original plans didn't have Sergeant Gander among the 1,977 names on the wall. Among the veterans who survived the prisoner of war camps, they had one policy, sharing any food that came into their possession. It was in that same spirit they insisted that Gander be included, ensuring they shared the same public remembrance with their canine companion. And that is how Sergeant Gander's name was added to the wall when it was unveiled on August 15, 2009, and it can be found on the monument to this day. On November 24, 2004, Princess Anne unveiled the Animals in War monument in London, England. The monument honors 60 animals for their heroics in war. One of those animals on the monument is Sergeant Gander. Gander is also remembered in Bass River, Nova Scotia, at the Forgotten Heroes Monument, where a statue to the loyal Newfoundlander can be found, designed by Nova Scotia sculptor Clifton Sears. And closer to home, on July 23, 2015, a statue of Gander and his handler was unveiled at the Gander Heritage Memorial Park in Gander, Newfoundland. Most notably, Sergeant Gander was awarded the Dickin Medal on October 27, 2000, by the People's Dispensary for Sick Animals. Founded by Maria Dickin, it is the leading veterinarian charity in the United Kingdom, and the medal was instituted to honor the wartime service of animals. Between 1943 and 1949, 32 homing pigeons, 18 dogs, 3 horses, and 1 cat were awarded the medal, and the medal is considered the animal equivalent to the Victoria Cross, the highest military award in the Commonwealth. It was presented to honor Gander for his sacrifice, and it was done thanks to the efforts of the Canadian War Museum, the Hong Kong Veterans Association, and the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association. They ensured Sergeant Gander was recognized for, quote, saving the lives of Canadian infantrymen during the Battle of Hong Kong in December 1941. Without Gander's intervention, many more lives would have been lost in the assault. This was the first time the Dickens Medal was awarded since 1949. The medal is now on a permanent display at the Hong Kong section of the Canadian War Museum. This is the end of the Sergeant Gander story. But I would like to end this episode with a note for another loyal and beloved Newfoundland dog. Happy birthday, Boris. I miss you every single day. And I was proud to be your person. Thank you for joining me this week on Canadian History X. Information from Valor Canada, the Newfoundland Club of America, Gander Airport Historical Society, Wikipedia, Canadian History Bits, CBC, Ottawa Citizen, and Vancouver Sun. This show is researched, produced, and written by me, Craig Baird, with the help of Dila Velasquez. Audio production and design by Rosalind Kufour. If this is your first time listening and you like what you heard, please take a moment and give us a five-star review to help other people find these amazing stories. And there are so many for you to sink your teeth into. If you enjoy this podcast, then please check out my other podcasts, From John to Justin, Canada, A Yearly Journey, Pucks and Cups, and Canada's Great War. We love hearing from you, so if you have a show topic you want me to cover, email me at craig at canadaehx.com, or stop by my website and social media. I'll include all of those in my show notes. Until next time, I'm Craig Baird, and this is Canadian History X.